talk a little bit about sort of unraveling dizziness in the, the clinic setting. And whoops, is it going to fall asleep on us again? Let's see, maybe not. Um, and we're really going to talk about how to obtain a focus history for some dizziness patients, how to formulate a uh, diagnosis, how to perform some of the, I guess it's just going to keep doing that, um, the key components of the exam and when additional testing might be helpful. We're not really going to get into the details, obviously, in 15 minutes for all the different potential diagnoses. We're really going to focus on sort of the process and some different strategies you might use to make that more efficient. So. Dizziness is certainly a challenge, we all know. The symptoms are very difficult from the patient's perspective because they can be very disabling and they're also very hard to describe. So sometimes they feel like we're not really listening to them. They may have seen multiple other people before and nobody really seems to care what they're feeling like. So they're really frustrated, they're anxious. And of course, we're thinking about how wide the differential is for this vague description of dizziness. And we're also thinking it's whatever it is, 3.30 on a Friday afternoon and we're, we have like five more patients to see and now we have a complicated dizzy patient to decipher. So we have all that pressure and we're also worried about missing something. We don't want to miss something which might be potentially uh, uh, more significant than BPB, for example. So when they walk in, this is kind of what we're walking into. It's sort of a flurry of all these words and uh, emotions and so forth that they're trying to hope that they're going to solve in this one visit. So part of what I think is helpful is to try to get the patient not to focus on what somebody's already told them. So don't, you know, they, they of course want to say, well, I, I have the crystal problem or I have Meniere's or I have whatever it happens to be. Instead, to try to bring them back to what specifically the sensations they're experiencing are, and there may be multiple, and to try to give them some vocabulary to help describe those in a way that um, can be helpful for you in, a, in arriving at a differential diagnosis. Oops. So one place it's helpful to look, I think, is uh, the International Classification of Vestibular Disorders. And the link's down there, I'll put it at the end too, but they basically it's some consensus definitions for different types of symptoms. So for example, dizziness is a spatial disorientation. Vertigo we tend to think as a description of self-motion when there isn't any motion, or a distorted sense of self-motion. And unsteadiness may be more like disequilibrium or imbalance. We're not really going to talk about presyncope and syncope since they tend to be less likely associated with vestibular disorders. But those are obviously part of your differential too. So once you've kind of focused on describing what the sensation is, and again, there might be multiple, trying to get each one of those and pull it apart into what when the first spell was, when the last one was, how often they're having them, how long they're lasting, if there are any obvious triggers for those, and if they have associated symptoms. And Joel Goebel likes to talk about the six million dollar questions, which really are to try to focus in on some of the more common symptoms that we can often ascribe more specifically to different otologic diagnoses, obviously not exclusively. So do you get dizzy when you're rolling over in bed? Are you light sensitive uh, during this uh, spell? Um, does your ear feel full or pressure? Do you feel a change in hearing? Um, does sound make you dizzy or does lifting, you know, lifting something heavy make you dizzy? Um, does the first attack knock you out for several hours or is it days at a time? And uh, potentially, are you lightheaded or feel like you're going to pass out or have you passed out? And um, as we kind of go through this, I've, in most cases, I try to be consistent. The things tend to be more logic or in blue or as those that are central or non logic or in red. So the other one, which I think is often helpful, too, in those questions is if you got new glasses. Surprisingly, a lot of times people realize that, yeah, they just got new multivocal lenses, they got new glasses, and that's when all their dizziness symptoms started. So it's always it's a simple question. Uh, don't forget to ask it. If you want to be more comprehensive, I think one questionnaire, there are different, lots of different questionnaires for dizziness symptoms. I think this one's kind of helpful. It can also be helpful in triaging. It's the dizziness symptom profile. And they're not going to go into any detail, but it's 31 questions. And they're really designed to try to, again, fit into seven different disorders that are listed over on the right side there to help you with clarifying your differential diagnosis. And they're going to rate the symptoms that they experience, sort of how strongly either they disagree that's part of what they experience or how strongly they agree that it's what they experience. And then all the questions kind of relate to all the different factors we mentioned. So how long things last, the environments that might trigger things, associated symptoms and so forth. Um, so those I think it's, that can be helpful. This is some example of the questions just out of the constraints of time. I'm not really going to go over them. 
Obviously, we're going to look for red flags, too, that might be more likely to be consistent to uh, central disorders. So obviously, headache, double vision, visual loss, cranial nerve deficits, and so forth. Um, those are the kind of things we just want to make sure we're, we don't miss and we don't forget to ask about or we don't see that in the history uh, from whoever referred them to us. So the key, I think, for a lot of dizziness disorders really is the timing, the triggers, and associations. So for very short lasting, in the order of seconds to maybe a couple minutes, by far the most common thing is going to be BPPV, of course. Um, often these people get better before they actually get in to see us. So they were referred for these dizzy attacks, and by the time they get to see us, they've already, they're already gone. But sometimes not. Um, cervical vertigo, sometimes related to vascular compromise or even neural uh, impact, can sometimes cause similar symptoms. Sound and pressure, obviously, we start thinking about fistula, we start thinking about canal dehiscence. Longer symptoms lasting in the order of days to weeks. Differential starts getting into vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis if they have associated hearing loss, uh, migraine uh, if they have a history of trauma and so forth, fistula, sometimes medications can fit into that too. Um, whereas the intermediate, longer lasting ones that have uh, dizziness symptoms, typically we're thinking of vestibular migraine and Meniere's disease, with really the distinction often being the evidence of progressive hearing loss. In the chronic symptoms that go on for months and months at a time, most common is going to be persistent postural perceptual dizziness, uh, sometimes much less likely, but mal de Barkman syndrome, which has some similarities in terms of some of the features. Obviously, some of these more chronic patients can also have bilateral vestibular hypofunction, and that may be why they're chronically imbalanced and feel dizzy. Um, associations always to look for, hearing loss, uh, headache, and then some of the pre-syncope, syncope symptoms that I mentioned earlier. Another thing that can be helpful in sort of narrowing your diagnosis is just how frequently these conditions occur. So this is an example of uh, a large clinic looking at over 500 patients and the difference in frequency of these diagnoses based on age. So we look at those that are younger than 40, um, I guess we don't have a pointer, but uh, VM is uh, vestibular migraine and 3PD is persistent postural perceptual dizziness. By far the most common diagnoses for some of the, for dizziness patients in a dizziness clinic. Whereas if you look in older patients over 80, you can see other causes, so a, a, a range of different things causing dizziness, uh, but bilateral vestibular hypofunction also very common. And as well, you can see BPPV is getting more common. Yep, Doug? Oh, I don't know that I see that it's any more common, but basically, again, I wasn't really going to talk about the diagnosis because we would be here for hours, but in terms of persistent postural perceptual dizziness, the way I think of it is, in some ways, in some ways it's similar to malditer barkman syndrome. So I think of it as sort of a central malad maladaptation related to uh, a sense of orientation. So it can be triggered by many different things, whether it's a vestibular crisis, a psychological crisis, some other type of medical crisis where a patient um, or individual develops some protective mechanisms which in the acute setting might be very helpful. So I think an analogy could be if you injure yourself uh, doing some kind of sporting activity, you might say pull a muscle. You develop a certain way of walking, maybe you might even use a crutch or some sort of assistance, but in the long term that's not really beneficial for you recovering. People can develop similar physical and psychological mechanisms to try to help themselves function but in the long term, they may be compensating, for example, for a unilateral vestibular injury from labyrinthitis. But in the long term, they really need to have physical therapy and potentially cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so really, the chronicity of symptoms is the primary definition, I think. Often, their description of their dizziness is quite vague. Um, but I think it is important not to ignore these people, because often there's an underlying etiology that we can treat, even if we have to combine it with other types of therapy. So that's the brief discussion, I guess. <laughs> um, Migraine and, and Meniere's, all, this discussion always comes up. I think um, many of the symptoms are in common, which I have listed there on the left. Uh, there are some differences obviously related primarily to the hearing loss changes, and we have potentially ways of distinguishing them with some imaging and so forth or other types of uh, audiologic testing. But remember that migraine is much, much more common than Meniere's, and in fact, when people have looked at it, even in Meniere's patients, migraine is more common, and if you treat Patients with Meniere's disease with migraine treatments, they often get better anyway. So often I would say it doesn't really matter. It doesn't mean we're not interested in what the diagnosis is, but in terms of the treatment, we can often do a lot by treating patients really almost in the same way. <laughs>
Uh, polypharmacy, especially in older patients, but in any patient, I think is another thing we have to always be very careful with because there's so many medications I put on the bottom there that 50% of the people over 65 take more than six medications. That's a National Health Service survey in Ireland, but I think we can't get similar data in the United States because the, uh, the uh, prescribing data is not as uh, focused. But I think we always have to think about interactions and medications causing chronic dizziness. And obviously multiple uh, diagnoses can coexist, and so we may have to separate these and think about how we might treat each of those independently. We're gonna talk briefly about uh, some exam things that are helpful. Obviously a normal uh, otoscopic exam, microscopic otis ot otic exam, uh, looking for signs of cholesteatoma, middle ear disease. If you're concerned about something like superior canal dehiscence or a fistula, do a Hennebert, a tragal, tragal occlusion, uh, full cranial nerve exam, uh, cerebellar exam. I still think that uh, Joel Goebel's 10 minute ex dizzy exam is a helpful thing to kind of look over and just remind yourself of a fairly streamlined way to do this. We'll cover some of those topics. And again, if superior canal dehiscence is something you're considering based on the symptom profile, just remember to do tuning fork testing. Do the tuning fork to the malleolus can be helpful if the patient hears it in their ear. That would be a, a typical finding, either with 256 or a 128 hertz uh, tuning fork. So in terms of the uh, physical exam, critical part is the looking at eye movements, the oculomotor exam. Um, so for nystagmus, we wanna look in primary gaze and lateral gaze. You wanna make sure that you're not causing them to look too far laterally, because you can cause some abnormalities. So I usually do sort of 20 degrees, so about 12 inches from center off. Um, and you're looking for either nystagmus in a normal situation absent or not changing direction with the direction the patient's looking, whereas with uh, centrally driven nystagmus, you might find that it's either vertical or potentially direction changing and that it is not affected by uh, visual fixation. Uh, smooth pursuit. Typically, you wanna, uh, you're kind of often tempted to do that too quickly, so smooth pursuit is, is not very fast. So we're kind of, imagine sort of a four second cycle, something like that, and having them follow, it's normal for that to become more saccadic as people get older, but that's really what you're looking for is excessive corrective saccades. And then a saccade test, the easiest thing I think is have them look at your nose and your finger, so just about this far apart. And as you move your finger, have them look between your nose and your finger. And again, you're looking for accuracy, you're looking for speed. It can be very much affected by medications, by age and so forth, so really, um, you're looking for those things. The main thing that's sort of really uh, clearly central is when they have hypermetric saccades, which is a cerebellar sign. Um, and then uh, test of skew, one we're, we'll talk about a little bit with the HINTS exam, but test of skew is another test that again, we're not always as familiar with. The easiest test I think is the cover and cover test. So put your um, hand in front of one of the individual's eyes. When you take it away, the eyes should be lined up in a vertical axis. If you remove your hand and the eyes, you see them either go from down, from up to down or down to up, where the vertical misalignment corrects when they can look at a target again, that's skew deviation. So that's not normal. Normally when you, when you remove your hand, and you can switch, obviously check either eye, um, the eyes should remain in alignment. That's different than the ocular tilt reaction, which is when you turn your head and you might see the eyes tort as well as uh, a tilt, as, as well as having a deviation. But in that case, again, um, that would be a peripheral finding. And then the vestibular ocular reflex, I brought my model here just because I think when you're doing VORA testing, it's always important to remember what the axis of the canals is. Sometimes I think we just sort of get in a hurry, we don't really think about it. So remember that the horizontal canal is not horizontal, right? So when you're doing tests, for example, for a head shake or corrective saccades, it's easier to put the head in the plane of the lateral canal so that when you move the head, you're really getting a pure response to what's, what's happening. Same thing when you're doing a Dix Hall Pike test, that we'll come back to a little bit. The reason you're turning their head 45 degrees is to line up that posterior canal on the vertical plane. Same thing when you're thinking about doing an Epley maneuver. Imagine how those canals are oriented so that you're repositioning those crystals. Um, in terms of the um, head shake nystagmus, again, usually what I do is, uh, again, tilt their heads forward slightly. The, the pace is about two hertz, which is kind of like, you know, you're staying alive for CPR. So it just kind of use that as the cycle time for rotating their head back and forth. Um, and positional testing, don't forget to do the Dick's Hall Pike. There's so many times, and in fact, I just saw a paper in the White Journal that um, like 50% of those that they think actually had BBB never actually had a diagnostic test. So it's, it's critical as it's easy to diagnose and it's common. So it's something we can treat. <clears throat> 
Um, posture, posture examination, doing a Romberg test, mostly a, a test of the dorsal afferents, and uh, cerebellar test. Simplest one is this one. After you've done your other test, just have them sit on the other thing. Just very quickly, you can tell if they can go extended arm to nose. You don't have to touch them. They don't have to touch you. So in the time of COVID, people get a little anxious about when they have to do things like that. Um, and then gait. I always recommend the patients sit in the waiting room in the, in the area so I can watch them walk when they don't think I'm watching them. See how they get up, see how they turn, see if they need assistance, see if they're doing sort of a really cautious gait where they're uh, kind of overcorrecting for things, how they manage when they go around in the room. Those are all really important parts of the exam. Do you need glasses to do the exam? Not really. Um, these are the, the Frenzel glasses. Obviously, they have the very high diopter lenses so you can remove fixation. Or the M glasses I usually carry in my pocket. They're a Fresnel, a Fresnel lens that does the same thing, just prevents fixation. Um, it can be helpful. It can increase either spontaneous nystagmus by removing fixation if it's a peripheral problem. And it can show you that it's central if, they, if, if fixation removal does not, actually does not improve, uh, if, if fixation does not suppress the nystagmus. Um, so those can be helpful. But I would say not necessary. Because again, most of the time you're thinking about BPPV, a lot of that nystagmus is torsional. And the torsional nystagmus really doesn't suppress with fixation. Hey, Cliff, yep. How many people with Fresnel glasses actually smile? <laughs> <laughs> well, they usually make other people smile, though, <laughs> which is probably almost worth it. <laughs> Um, most of BPPV is the posterior canal. We're not going to talk about the other variants because most of the time you don't see them. If you do, you can figure out how to treat them. So it is important to know posterior canal. So again, thinking about the location or the orientation of the canals, you're putting their head at 45 degrees, so you're putting that posterior canal in the vertical plane. When you're flipping them over, you're making that canal horizontal, you're rolling them over so the debris is going to flow through that canal. You sit them back up, it's going to go back uh, or it's not going to be irritating um, the posterior canal. It's helpful to think about the orientation of the eyes again in the orbit for the same reason. If their head is tilted back like this and you have the eyes in the plane, you can imagine in this case, if we have them look towards their nose, you're pulling their eyes in the plane of the canal. So the movement of the eye is gonna be more vertical. If they look down, you're in the, in the plane 90 degrees to the posterior canal and their movement of their eye is gonna be more torsional. So again, if they don't have those characteristic findings, that's gonna be more suspicious for something that's not BPPV. Um, skew deviation, we already talked about. Acute vestibular syndrome. That's acutely pertinent patient. Yep. So I think the skew deviation thing is, is probably one of the most commonly missed things. And I think something you, you may have mentioned earlier is watch these patients walk into the room and watch them walk around and kind of manipulate their body as well. Because that's where you pick up like gait and you pick up the grabbing things when they walk in. And just look at them. Um, and that may be skew deviation. Very, very important. Yep, I would agree. I would agree. And the easiest way, like I said, for skew deviation, use your you can use your hand, but your hand it's easy to fixate on. So sometimes it's easier to take whatever you have a blank piece of paper from the chart, use a white piece of paper, less less likely they're gonna cause fixation artifacts. So um, and we already talked about all the testing. So in acute vestibular syndrome, it's really the same things we just went over, except in this case, it's actually more sensitive than doing an MRI. So in the, in the ER, or the, it's, again, these are not usually patients we're gonna be seeing in our clinic. They could be if we get them in as an urgent, you know, dizzy patient for a couple days or something. These are really the critical tests to do to try to rule out uh, a posterior fossa stroke. Um, I've summarized this in sort of a complicated flow diagram, but the idea is to kind of think about the same things we mentioned earlier. So timing, triggers, and associations, and to find a way to break these up so you can sort out what symptoms people have. And really there's only a couple key physical finding things. Aside from the ocular motor tests and the positional test I mentioned, it's uh, uh, thinking about the dix hall pike test. And if you're concerned about a superior canal dehiscence, do a tragal test, ask them if they, get, if they have vertigo with that. Ask them if they felt dizzy when they had tympanometry. That's another simple one that often will make people realize that that makes them dizzy. Diagnostic testing. Audiogram, very useful, obviously for many reasons. Um, but in our case, sometimes it can be helpful in distinguishing between labyrinthitis and vestibular neuritis, Meniere's disease and migraine, or looking for characteristic findings for a superior canal dehiscence syndrome, so very useful. Vestibular testing, even though I'm a big fan of vestibular testing, it's not often as helpful as we would like. Um, it is helpful for confirming either unilateral or peripheral, or unilateral or bilateral vestibular hypofunction. 
It's useful for looking at subtle central signs uh, in terms of involvement of the dizziness symptoms, because that might be why they're not compensating. Um, it's also helpful to ensure that they have bilateral function. Time? Two minutes? All right. Um, to see if they have bilateral function before you do a destructive procedure. The last thing you want to do is make sort of a vestibular cripple by operating on their last year that has function. Um, and uh, uh, superior canal dehiscence. Again, looking for the characteristic signs of that. And sometimes it's helpful just when you have no idea what's going on. The symptoms are so confusing, getting some objective data can be helpful to get you a starting point for where to go next. We can do testing for all levels of the vestibular system, um, whether it's the corticospinal tract, the ocular motor exam, um, and the labyrinth itself. Typically in our clinic for basic testing, we do ocul basic ocular motor testing, positional testing, uh, caloric testing, and uh, platform posturography. Uh, because those are uh, things that can be fairly helpful in understanding the, the simple things that I mentioned. So bilateral versus unilateral vestibular hypofunction, compensation mechanisms. Do they have at least essentially normal uh, central uh, uh, neurologic function? Those can be very helpful. We also generally do a uh, cognitive exam as well in a dizziness handicap inventory so that we can track symptoms over time. For patients that have more complicated disease, we're trying to maybe localize specifically in the labyrinth where it's happening, where the disease is occurring, how extensive it is. We do what we call full testing, which includes also a video head thrust test. It includes a rotational chair test and uh, VEMP testing, subjective visual vertical. The head thrust test can be helpful because you can potentially test all three uh, canals on either side and get some information about sort of how pervasive the deficit is because most of the time the canals are gonna be out on each side uh, completely. It's not always as helpful for most people, but that can be in some cases. Uh, rotational chair, very helpful in assessing bilateral vestibular hypofunction and looking at compensation mechanisms. Have they compensated for the injury that they have? Have they compensated for a complete vestibular loss? Um, and then VEMP, primary use, I think, for most people is helping really to get some physiologic data supporting the diagnosis of a superior canal uh, dehiscence syndrome. And subjective visual vertical test, also helpful to look at utricular function. And again, if, if subjective visual vertical test is way off, so if they're at six or seven degrees, that's much more common to be a central sign than it is uh, peripheral. And then some specialized tests that can be helpful for a superior canal, again, tone and pressure tests to look um, at the eye movements that would be typical for that uh, disorder. Helpful thing sometimes, iPhone. A lot of times people are there at home, they have, they're dizzy, they have their spouse or friend take a video of their eyes. Do you get a picture of what happens with the nystagmus? It's amazing how cooperative the patients can be with when somebody else is taking the picture. One of the challenges we have is getting insurance coverage for some of these tests, so I guess apropos of that talk earlier, maybe I should write more letters to the ENT support, uh, uh, political support. But anyway, that's another issue. Um, vestibular testing, not indicated for kind of standard BPPV. Imaging, uh, MRI, sometimes useful. Asymmetric hearing loss. Obviously, anything that's abnormal in the neurologic exam, MRI if you're concerned about vascular pathology. Um, CT temper bone, often again, very helpful in kind of clinching a diagnosis of superior canal dehiscence or looking at potential impact of middle ear disease. Uh, imaging, not appropriate for BPPV unless they have neurologic symptoms or they haven't gotten better with the appropriate treatment. Don't forget physical therapy. They, not only do they help the patients, they also help you tell if your diagnosis is right. So if, if they're compensating, they're getting better, that can be very helpful. And having that interaction, just like we talked about or we heard about with audiology, having a good interaction with your physical therapist can be critical to getting these patients better. Um, I think that was it. Thanks very much.